October 31, 2020. Reading from Weaver's Wisdom, Ancient Precepts for a Perfect Life by Sadhguru Sivaya Subramanya Swami. This is a book, an English translation of Tirukkural, the first 108 chapters, that's 1080 couplets in simple modern American English. And I'm reading the prologue, that is the Pairam, the first four chapters of this book. This introduction gives a summary and also highlights how the whole of this, the summer substance of Tirukkural is brought out in, this, in these four chapters. These chapters are called Pairam in Tamil which is same as prologue. I will read from the book. If you have the book, you can follow, or if you, you can get it on, the online edition is about $3. A paperback can be anywhere from 9 to $6 to $9. So I start reading. God Supreme is explained in no uncertain terms, beginning with the primordial Om, the primal sound of the universe, the A of many alphabets. Nothing would exist without the constant resonant resounding Om. The soundless sound, the impulse of creation, ever emanating from the cosmic dance of God Shiva, the source of all three worlds, of course, here you will find the bias of Saiva Siddhanta and uh, Tirukural by Thiruvallavar is very neutral, very secular. It is theistic, that means it's God believing or at least believing in a supreme power, but it is not named anywhere and it doesn't talk about the three worlds but uh, it can always be interpreted. So uh, many people, uh, every religion, every faith can find suitable interpretation. And so that's what we find here. This is interpreted as a Saivite scripture, which it's acceptable to some, but if, if it is not acceptable, that can be ignored because we can always substitute, in the place of Shiva, we can substitute Krishna, Jesus, Jehovah, Allah, Brahman, uh, Mahavishnu, anything of uh, Sakti. We can substitute whatever is suitable or simply say primordial being or supreme being or supreme spirit, whichever way. But the thing is, there is, uh, we as humans as a whole are very small. I mean, in this, in this universe, the earth itself is a small spot. And so an individual human being, however capable, however capable and however great their achievement is still minuscule compared to the cosmos. So we have to accept and we have to recognize and surrender to the fact that there is a much superior power. So that's what he says here. The, 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 throughout the first 10 kurals, one is encouraged to worship, to worship, to worship, and thus soften negative karmas. So here it comes as the karma theory also is brought in. But again, to, to live a good life, one should have good thought and good mind. And uh, one simple way is to, is devotion and surrender to, the, to a supreme being and be humble and humility is a great help in 
not doing anything harmful, which will come back. So that's what is meant by karma. Speaking of the holy feet, the weaver tells us of the ancient tradition so embedded in Indian culture that even today, touching the feet of a holy icon, a swami, sadhu, elder, and one's mother and father is a gesture of deepest respect. In this book, it is in English translation, uh, this author refers to Thiruvalluvar as a weaver. Uh, it's acceptable for two reasons. It is, it is focused and the goal is to spread the wisdom of Thiruvalluvar among non-Tamils. So, the Thirukural and Thiruvalluvar may sound easy for a Tamil-speaking person, but it is kind of hard for most non-Tamils. Unless somebody is highly interested, they won't bother to know and repeat that. But Thiruvalluvar was known, is uh, supposedly was the weaver who was enlightened and who could, co who could contribute this great literature for the language and the society. So he was a sage. So we can call him a weaver sage or weaver saint. So in this book, he's referred to as a weaver. And a weaver is also, in a way, a translation of Valluvar. Valluvar being a, a, a caste as well as the profession. Valluvars are by profession weavers. They used to be. So here he is referred to as a weaver, and we can call this as the weaver's, weaver's wisdom or ancient precepts for a perfect life. It is in these first four chapters that the weaver creates a creates the war with strong, taut strands that stretch from one end of the loom to the other. As in the Vedas, the priest mantras are described as the warp connecting this world with the heavenly Shivaloka. It is in these four, first four chapters that the weaver creates the warp, the strong, taut strands that stretch from one end of the loom to the other. As in the Vedas, the priest mantras described as the warp connecting this world with the heavenly Sivaloka, each strand's color indicating a pattern of excellence yet to come. The first section of Weaver's Wisdom tells us of the importance of God, Siva's holy feet, of rain, of renunciates, and of virtuous living called Dharma or Aram in Tamil. Here and in many chapters to come, reincarnation, which, which is called Punarjanma in Sanskrit, is set forth in a most pragmatic way. In the tenth kural, that's in the tenth couplet, the weaver tells of the boundless ocean of births that can be crossed only when one has become bound to Shiva's feet. Once again, as a reminder, uh, we can substitute for Shiva any, any deity's name that you are comfortable with or that you have grown up with, like it could be Vishnu, it could be Krishna, it could be, uh, could be Jehovah, could be Allah, or could be Brahman. Or we can also call it uh, Paramatma or Supreme Being, Supreme Spirit, Shakti, anything of uh, anything that uh, you you feel comfortable with. In chapter two, the author shows that in this day, man was in his day, man was a vital, responsible part of ecology, inseparably entangled within it. This reverence for the environment forms another group of threads in the warp of the weaver's pattern yet to be unfolded. 
the Abrahamic religions, upon which historically most scientists based their postulations, brought to mankind the attitude that man is not a part of ecology, but set apart from it, created to control and selfishly exploit it. This perspective has led to mountainous problems such as pollution, waste and deforestation, extermination of whole species, drought, and much, much more. The weaver speaks eloquently of rain in chapter 2. And in verses throughout the book, he says that good behavior of the people brings rain, hence wealth, and adharmic or unvirtuous behavior brings drought, hence poverty, leading to famine. A point is made that should rain fall, the worship within the temples and home of home saints of God, and the gods would cease. And the joyous festivals, which bring, which during that time were many, would be held no more. So that's uh, something you know, like many books of scriptures, some of the couplets can be uh, interpreted slightly differently or even widely varying. But here, in one of the couplets, as we will be seeing later, uh, the the if rain, rain stops, everything will stop. That's obvious because there will be famine, there will be drought, there, there won't be any, uh, any produce, so the worships and the, the rituals will not be possible. <clears throat> Chapter 3 creates another warp on the weaver's loom, the thought threads of the renunciate and ascetic for in his day, it was the sadhus, swamis, and rishis who guided community leaders and individual seekers on the right path and kept the monarch, kept the monarch on the side of dharma, divine law, and order. In verse 21, the weaver tells how the Vedas exalt the greatness of virtuous renunciates. And in verse 29, he explains the point, the pious men who have compassion for all life are looked up to and respected as the priestly ones. Chapter 4, Assert, Asserting Virtue's Power, defines the fourth set of strands in the pale-colored, many-threaded warp on the weaver's wood Warlu. This completes the four part set of lengthwise strands and forms the base of the cloth. The white threads of Sivanas, the transcendent blues of rain or Akasha, the saffron yellow threads of sacrifice and renunciation, and the violet rays of virtue. These are the four kinds of grace we must have in life. God, rain, holy, holy ones, and virtue. So again, uh, it's a metaphor brought out by this uh, author, Sadhguru Sivaya Subramani Swami. Uh, Shiva is supposed to have his abode in the Himalayas. So it is snow covered. So white is assigned typically to Shiva. And then rain is given the translucent blue because sky looks blue. Saffron yellow threads of sacrifice. So the sacrifice is the renunciates in Hindu and Buddhist and Jain faiths where saffron color 
robes. So that is, he calls the third is the saffron and then the violet rays of virtue. These are the four kinds of grace. So these are considered grace, God's grace, grace of uh, rainfall, grace of uh, renunciates, who, not just renunciates, there are a whole section telling about the, the duties or dharma for renun renunciates and they have, they have to prove themselves and they should be kind, knowledgeable, useful, helpful and so on. These are the four kinds of grace we must have in life. God, rain, holy ones and virtue. Chapter 5 begins the threads that crisscross the warp to form the weft. These are the rich color threads of virtue and wealth that the weaver uses to create the tapestry of life. So we can imagine he being a weaver, he has composed this, uh, this uh, almost a scripture, this book of uh, moral code or ethical code, also the poetic book. Like Gita is the, uh, is the song of Krishna. You can call this Kural as the song of Valluvar, Tiruvalluvar, the particular weaver sage, the song of the weaver sage. So after say, establishing the four main threads, the weaver now is going to weave the cross threads to form the colorful robe.